Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome your panel on blockchain and cryptocurrency. What to expect next? Moderated by Executive Director of Global Market Development at the Milken Institute, Stacey Warden. I know I'm here. Best session of the Milken Institute MENA Global Summit right here. I am very pleased to have Eva Kali, who is the, uh, a member of the European pa Parliament representing the Hellenic delegation. She is the youngest member of the European Parliament, also the most beautiful. Uh, Mike Novogratz, who is the founder and CEO and most beautiful member of Galaxy <laughs> Digital. <laughs> Charlie Noyes, who is a partner and uh, the most beautiful partner at uh, Paradigm uh, Capital and a self-described MIT dropout. So we're very happy to have, uh, have this illustrious panel. And Mike, let me start with you. And if you uh, don't mind my language, um, what the hell happened last year? <laughs> well, we had a lot more people in the crypto <laughs> session last year. Um, listen, we had a classic a euphoric bubble. Uh, 2017, and it ended uh, you know, January 2018. Uh, it was a bubble because the idea of crypto and Bitcoin and sovereignty, uh, censorship-resistant currency, uh, is a big idea. And bubbles happen around really big ideas. And bubbles happen around ideas that usually change the way society acts later on. Uh, if you think about the internet bubble, if you think about the railroad bubble, uh, prices get way ahead of reality. And prices got way ahead of reality last year um, in Bitcoin, but mostly in all the other cryptocurrencies. And bubbles crack. I mean, bubbles crack because regulators realized they were way behind the eight ball. And they said, oh, shit, what's going on? And so they slammed the brakes or tapped the brakes, depending on what jurisdiction you were in. And but what got ahead of what <coughs> exactly? I'm sorry? What got ahead of what exactly? Well, the story. So, you know, crypto was a big story. It was the democratization of finance. It was breakdown of trust and authority. It was breakdown of trust in banks, breakdown of trust in, in central authorities. So we were going to create this new world of peer-to-peer -peer where we don't need to trust central banks. We don't need to trust governments. We don't need to trust J.P. Morgan. That story was powerful and it resonated with the people. It wasn't an institutional bubble. It's the first bubble I've ever studied where the taxi driver was the first buyer, not the last buyer. Mm -hmm. uh, no institutions were really in it, and that's why the regulators missed it. Mm -hmm. Regulators have their contacts at J.P. Morgan and Goldman Sachs and Nomura. Uh, they don't have their contacts with Mr. and Mrs. Watanabe. Mm -hmm. And so regulators were way behind the eight ball. And so when it really took off in October, November, December, then people got scared because all of a sudden you had a trillion dollars of market cap and people were pouring money into things they had no idea uh, what they were pouring money into. And so in lots of ways it was a correction that was needed. Uh, it set, the, it set the, the movement back some. But bubbles are neat because they suck in capital and they suck in energy and they suck in both human capital and physical plant and equipment. And then all of this energy goes to work on making the next bright shiny toy. And so what's been going on, you know, literally since last year, has been people toiling away at building you know, Web 3.0. There are eight different, 10 different, 80 different versions of what will be some form of decentralized, you know, global supercomputer. Uh, what's been going on is in the Bitcoin space, institute, uh, companies have been building the architecture for institutions to move into the space. What does that mean? They need good custody solutions. They need accountants that will actually audit. Uh, they need law firms that will actually deal. And so there's been a monster movement, you know, and there's been big announcements like Fidelity coming into custody, uh, BACT, which is a New York stock exchange, ICE, you know, company getting into one day settlement and in futures and in custody. And so as we see trusted institutions, there's an irony, actually, quite frankly, that this was a, this was a, we don't need to trust the institutions movement. But to get the institutions in, you need to trust the institutions. Mm. And that, that architecture is being put in place. And so you're going to see in the next three, six, 12 months this movement towards uh, institutions playing in the game. And, and, you know, Bitcoin, I separate Bitcoin from the rest. You know, Bitcoin, I think, has, has taken a space as digital gold. 
this store of value that's valuable just because it's valuable. You know, there's 118 elements on the periodic table, I think 118 elements. Um, now you're just showing off. Uh, well, gold has value just because it does, but the rest of the elements only have value because we use them. Yeah. And yeah. so what you're going to see is the rest of crypto, if it's Ethereum or EOS or you know, tel the Telegram or Hashgraph, they're going to need to prove usage. And then you're going to do some kind of discounted cash flow of, well, why are these things valuable? They're valuable because there's some cost of transaction times the amount of transactions. You're going to have some valuation models. And it's not going to go to infinity, right? Last year, people were like, oh, it's M2 plus M3, and these things could be worth the total $80 trillion GDP of the whole world. Uh, that was crazy talk. Yeah. And so I think you're, but you are, it doesn't mean that this space isn't going to be an important space. And in 10 years, it's not going to be its own asset class. There'll, there'll be tokens. You know, this is going to be part of the financial landscape. Okay, so well, I, I do want to talk about the future, but I want to drill into sort of the past year just one more round. Charlie, this is like Beanie Babies or, or, or what? I mean, you know, what, what happened? And, what, and, and maybe to Mike's point, and then Ava, I'll, I'll ask you this as well. You know, uh, uh, in the back room, I said to Ava, I'm going to ask you some regulatory questions. And she said, that's so boring. Please don't just ask me regulatory questions. But I'm going to ask you one, which is, you know, Mike said, what, did, what would regulators, what should they have done, you know, earlier if he, and he said they were late to the game? But Charlie, let me turn to you first and, and ask you, you know, if you were a year ago, did, would you have been surprised by the past year? And, what, and, and if, if so, what would you have missed? Or what were kind of the early signs? And, and, and how should we think about the market going forward? Yeah, so I was not surprised by the last year. Um, I don't think that there is much regulators could have done to prevent the 2017 bubble that popped last year. Um, beyond maybe incentivizing more education, consumer education. Um, but as Mike said, it's, in, it's a strange market and probably the first instance where we saw a bubble that wasn't able to be corralled on the institutional side, um, where you have sort of like accretive sources of capital, um, where you know, from a pers notional value in the market, you can kind of go target more easily than, you know, 100 million consumers that are distributed globally and are relatively more uh, egalitarian, evenly distributed. It's just a very hard problem. Um, and I don't think that anyone in the space itself could necessarily um, have even educated people because it's still very early. But the reason that it happened, or my personal belief in the reason that it happened, um, is it's very, very hard to price uh, these assets today. It's very, very hard to price Bitcoin. It's very, very hard to make um, an argument around what is like a valid way of considering Bitcoin's value. Um, and I think the speculative mania was largely a result of people considering that there was lower uncertainty on Bitcoin's sort of expected return or expected outcome than there actually was. Um, and to some extent, that was probably true. There's more eyeballs and more capital in the space today than there was before the bubble. Um, but it got far ahead of sort of this notion of uncertainty. Um, and so I mostly do early stage venture at Paradigm. Um, and there's this notion in venture of, you don't really consider in any given series seed or series A round, like a risk and return. Um, you consider expectancy on outcomes and uncertainty over them. So the reason that you would consider um, the TAM of transportation for Uber at its Series A before product market fit um, is because it's essentially impossible to attach any like real notion of expected risk and return. Um, something that can go up 10,000x is like fundamentally much different than an asset that has essentially linear or non-convex uh, non expectation. So in Bitcoin's case, the argument here for why the bubble happened, why it made sense that it happened, and why it doesn't really matter ultimately, um, is to the extent that you believe that it has sufficiently large um, outcome potential or sufficiently high return potential, um, it's really like a matter of moving decimals on what it should be worth today 
or what price you would be willing to underwrite today. Um, and I think if on a day-to-day -day basis, like would you be willing to underwrite an investment in Bitcoin at 3,500 versus 6,000 is essentially an impossible question to answer and not one that's really worth spending time answering. The venture analogy again would be that in a Series A round for a company that you have conviction in, like a 20% valuation premium is not something that any serious VC would ever, yeah. you know, allow to change their opinion. Yeah, so. yeah. So, uh, Ava, I think I heard that, you know, it doesn't really matter and regulators couldn't have done anything. And then Mike even said, well, you know, it was the bubbles are good. Uh, and, you know, they, it allows all this, uh, this, this effort to happen. But at the same time, I read about this guy in Norway that you have objection to that. Well, did I, I, did I so bu overly... Bubbles are, are good if you ride them up and sell them at the high. They're not good if you buy them at the yes, high okay. and sell them at the low. <laughs> um, you know, there was a lot of people that lost a lot of money. Yeah. And, you know, regulators' jobs... Uh, are to protect the little guy. Yeah. It's not to protect the rich guys. Yeah, right. So uh, I was just going to say about this guy in Norway that, you know, he, he sold everything to buy Bitcoin and now he's, his, he and his family are homeless. I mean, he's a knucklehead, obviously, but, you know, where were the regulators and what, what you know, what would you have done differently if you were... Okay, uh, let me just say that um, it started as an, uh, a solution to what central banks couldn't achieve to protect our deposits and people felt it was an anti-systemic movement that it could help them uh, be independent and um, it was really exciting. So there were people, um, two guys, um, too young to have a bank account, that they had a crazy idea, they had a cool name a blockchain name, everything, if you put blockchain, it's, it's becoming cool actually, even now. So um, they, they put it here on the internet and they managed to get 15 million euros and they were panicking. They went to this law firm, friends of mine, and they were asking, so are we in trouble? What can we do? So they raised this amount of money and they didn't know what to do with it. Um, so uh, I think it's not uh, easy to say that we could have done something before. If people want to gamble, especially in the black market, then they will gamble. Uh, what, what we have to do is to educate legislators first. They have to understand the technology and they have to protect uh, consumers, to give them clear definitions, to give legal certainty to the market so that it can work and um, to realize the, real, the, the value of blockchain. So I would say uh, we're getting there, we have a roadmap, and I have to, to say whoever was a fraud, there are laws for that, he was a fraud, and you can claim your money back. Um, I, still, it was not very clear if uh, whoever said they are blockchain or they have a jurisdiction that uh, is in Europe and we can do something about it. Um, it, was, it was not clear in the beginning, we could not achieve that. But we're trying to get there. It's an, it's an innovative solution that it's, it has no barriers. It's global. You cannot stop it. You cannot limit it. Um, I, I would say that we're getting there now to understand uh, the barriers it has and to make sure that people will, um, will know the risks to take. And maybe to separate also the value of the blockchain itself and the ICOs. So everybody that had an idea, they could use it as a crowdfunding platform to get you know, um, cash and to, to manage to, to give equity or nothing and get their idea going. So there are some ideas that they were presented last year and uh, we still don't know it, but if there is a solid team and a good idea behind that, it could work, but it would take time. So one thing I could say is that legal certainty and the price volatility was really connected but at the same time, there was not much we could do if people wanted to gamble into crazy ideas because they felt this anti-systemic uh, movement had uh, arise and they should have been part of it. Some disagreement in that, listen, if you look at just what the SEC in the US, I won't talk about Europe, but if you look at what the SEC in the US did, they were slow. They, they could have told people, they were kind of giving slow hints, maybe this. But they said everything is a security, so basically yeah, they, they, they didn't kill the They, they weren't technology. really clear. I mean, listen, by the end of the year, they were very clear, and all of a sudden, all the yeah. ICOs stopped because people were like, okay, now the rules are clear. Hmm. Early in, they weren't clear. They were, we're not sure if it's a security or not. They were, they were behind because the Because not everything is a security. 
I, I got well, it. Well, the irony so is that they probably should have looked more like securities. Yes, and, right. and, and quite frankly, most of the ICO fundraising was done as a security. It might, they might have turned into something that wasn't a security later as the, as the ecosystem got decentralized, but almost all ICOs were originally uh, securities, and then maybe they became decentralized. And so they, the SEC got a framework around it. They've said Bitcoin is certainly not a security, and they even said Ethereum probably started a security, but we're not going to call it a security anymore. Mm. It's decentralized enough. Mm. And now that seems to be the test. Is it decentralized enough mm. uh, that it's not a security? security. But the SEC was a little slow in that. And a lot of the fraud and a lot of the pain came in these ICOs, you know, because, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. people and then, felt like they missed Bitcoin, so they got to get the next one. Yeah. I mean, former um, CEO of Mozilla, he raised $35 million in 30 seconds with an ICO. I mean, with Brave, right? So, I mean, so, Charlie, uh, I would like to say But it's a great tool you... besides that. It's a great tool because you can raise money for an amazing idea when you cannot get funded by banks, when you cannot get loans. And yeah, uh, But the question is, if, if the venture world should... It isn't going to fund you, and banks aren't going to fund you, should, yeah. should people that don't know anything fund Well, in you? Europe, it's not easy in any case, so I think it's a, an excellent tool. It depends who uses it. If it solves a problem, and if people want to believe in an idea, why not? I mean, um, I'm not sure everybody's bankable, so it's not just you know, you know people I, that can have access to the banks. There are people that they don't. Charlie, if you're too useful. polite, you're never going to get in, man. You've got you to gotta just... <laughs> I, I'm just waiting for my point to... to <laughs> to be made by this discussion. Uh, like, the correct advice from regulators is that consumers should not have put money into this stuff. I mean, that's just, like, that's just clear. In fact, the number, the number of examples of, like, where there will be a positive outcome on ICOs broadly um, is incredibly de minimis. Like, I, I would bet I could count them on one hand out of hundreds. Um, so it's sort of like, regardless of whether these things are securities or not, whether or not, like, we... The fact that we're not sure how to characterize them um, and that we're still arguing over the legalese of whether or not these were unregistered security offerings doesn't really matter. Um, like, no one understands, or broadly, um, no one really understands what was being sold, how to value these things, um, what an investment looks like, whether you're underwriting a pre-product market fit you know, serious seed venture startup, or if these things are able to have a market cap of $300 million on day one, like just on its face, that doesn't make any sense. Um, so I guess I trust the venture market to figure out how these early stage things should be funded. Um, and I think the correct advice at this point is it doesn't really matter um, whether or not under existing securities laws, like we can directly characterize these tokens like the correct advice either way is that consumers should not be playing in a market that the most sophisticated investors would self-admittedly say we don't fully understand yet or we barely understand. What would happen, right, so if you think about all of these cryptos, they were ecosystems. So Bitcoin creates this community. You talk about community builders all the time, 2017. You know, can you build a community? Well, so we're going to build a community of a decentralized version of Uber. That means we're going to get drivers and riders and create a peer-to-peer -peer system. Well, that's all well and good, but they didn't have the architecture. The, 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 the pipes weren't laid to even build that decentralized community on. And so all of these ICOs, all of these tokens, were literally just communities of speculators. And so it was literally past the parcel, and the last guy holding the stick was in trouble. Yeah. Um, if you think about multi-level marketing schemes, right? Amway, at least Amway has a product. It might be a great product. At the bottom, they have a product. So, you know, in time, there will be these decentralized systems that work. Their, the communities will be built, but they're gonna get built around actually doing something. And last year, and even continuing, most of the community was just a speculative one. People calling friends, hey, this is a hot project. Uh, you know, and, and a lot of it happened in Asia, the, you know, the Asian, I lived in Hong Kong for a long time. You know, people in China and you know love to gamble. It's just you look at gambling levels in Macau versus Las Vegas, even, and this became a new casino. Uh, it became a casino in Japan, and it became a casino, casino in Korea. And so, three big Asian cultures, uh, countries where there was huge volumes. Again, mostly based on this idea of speculation. Uh, you know, and in some ways. 
the best businesses, if you look at the most profitable businesses, right, BitMEX, which is a futures exchange and, uh, that provides 50 to 80 times leverage, still makes a million dollars a day, cha-ching, cha-ching, because there's still, even at these levels, a, 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 a surging amount of people that love to still gamble. But the real work, you know, the kind of revolution uh, that will change finance is happening. It's just going to happen slower, and it's going to be broadly, you know, a fintech business. So, let me, I, want, I want to sort of separate out the financial sector uh, future and blockchain more broadly future. So, well, I want to talk about both of them. So, you guys, I want you to, and I, and I should say that we're going to leave some time for questions at the end. So, uh, get ready for the mic. Um, but I want you to polish off your crystal balls and uh, tell me what the financial ecosystem uh, will look like you know, what role will Bitcoin, uh, you know, will there be, will it be a winner take all? Will there be a bunch of where, how will this kind of structurally play out? And um, maybe Charlie, I'll start with you this time. Yeah, so again, um, personal opinion in the sense that um, as a firm, we strongly value contrarianism. And I think, again, we actually don't really understand or uh, there is not broad consensus on how to characterize any of this stuff. Certainly not value it, but um, do they let you on investor roadshows, your partners? Because you're, you're <laughs> fair question. Uh, <laughs> yes, and I guess I wonder. I wonder if people would really prefer to hear uh, a false sense of security. Uh, I think out of the space so far, oh, they they, they do trust me. I'm <laughs> I think that we've completed the largest fundraise in the space so far with probably the most institutional group of LPs. Um, and this is, I think, the most sober version of the pitch or the one that makes the most sense today. Um, but, um, yeah, we, we don't really know what any of this stuff is. My best guess is that Bitcoin's an attempt to be sovereign commodity money, um, that Ether is also an attempt to be sovereign commodity money. Um, and... A couple, couple interesting tokens look like equity. Some people are issuing debt. But we don't understand this stuff well enough to characterize it yet. Um, so. What's your most, so that's kind of your most maybe likely conservative. What's your most out there kind of like sure. potential scenario? So the out there view, and this is probably way too niche, uh, but the bull case would be that what we are enabling on, on these platforms is a really novel form of coordination. You could view Bitcoin as um, potentially the simplest, but also um, maybe the most profound in coordination on sort of um, a new store of value or a credible new store of value. It's, you know, it hasn't, gold hasn't really had many serious competitors in a while. Um, but beyond that, some of the things you're seeing developed on top of Ethereum look a lot like um, computational uh, coordination problems. So I guess the example I would use is um, in many marketplace ecosystems, things like Uber, Airbnb, etc., um, you see something very similar as to what's happening on Ethereum um, and other similar platforms. But the difference being that because they're programmable, um, the specificity with which you can coordinate people is far greater. Um, so there are examples uh, today of, of people um, essentially issuing and underwriting as an anonymous collective um, synthetic total return swaps with like a couple hundred million dollars of notional outstanding collateral behind them um, in order to issue a synthetic version of USD on Bitcoin um, without any underlying uh, fiat collateral. So there's a bunch of interesting stuff happening, but it's extremely niche and specific. Um, and I don't think that it makes sense for most people to spend time looking at this stuff up until you need to rather zoom out and look at whether or not you can buy at the highest level um, like the ideas that have the most consensus around them. Bitcoin is like sovereign commodity money being probably the best example of this. Mm -hmm. Eva, what's, what's your crystal ball say? I, I want just to say that in Europe we have a study that said from OECD there are 130 billion of hidden fees for our transactions, which means there is a lot of space to improve that using this technology. It's a technology, okay? So you can use that to remove friction. You can make it faster. You can make it safer and easier. 
Um, so if I wanted to send money to Greece now, it would take me three days. So with uh, using blockchain, it could take me like a few mi minutes to do that. And it's more safe. And coming from Greece, I would say that uh, after the economic crisis uh, that hit us and the capital controls we had and in Cyprus banks closing, shutting down and everybody losing their deposits, I would say there's a huge value in blockchain. You can avoid that. You can have control of your assets. You can have control of your data. So I think the value of the technology is there. I don't care about the prices. I don't care about the price volatility. I, I don't think it represents exactly the value. Um, what I can see is potential. I see it's a, a technology that can uh, give us tools to improve everything. And this is part of the business. And this is just fintech. And if you combine blockchain with artificial intelligence, which I would um, uh, define as like automation and machine learning, then you can have, uh, you can execute um, very fast smart contracts in an automatic way and then you can have a lot of uh, safety there so imagine if you have um, on supply chains you use blockchain and you try to send something in um, uh, you know, know hundred thousand miles away and then you have to uh, send it and check if it passed from the specific locations you agreed and if it didn't you get a specific fee for that, or you can cancel um, the supply chain, or you can track down all the boxes, and if there is a bad, um, uh, maybe production, you can find immediately where it is, and you can remove all the products. I would say there is huge potential there. It removes friction, it can um, use automation, and achieve uh, great ideas and examples to, um, to produce new, new kind of value. And on behalf of the European Union, because I, I was struggling to explain it, to understand it first, and then to explain it to my colleagues, uh, I would say we're very uh, supportive of this technology, open-minded, and uh, we don't want to use uh, securities or something. We don't want to use the old definitions. We want to be creative, like the shared economy. You cannot fit it in old boxes. You have to wait and see how it develops. So um, there's going to be a new independent organization coming from the institutions that will monitor the technology and uh, will try to, uh, to clear a bit this, uh, the noise around the ICOs and give some verifications and uh, make sure that people will know when and how they can invest and what they can support and uh, some definitions <coughs> on that. So I see we're building you know, uh, on this technology and around that. Plus, we are just now drafting the budgets for the next seven years. <clears throat> and we have nine billion to create a digital economy in Europe. And part of the six sectors we have, it's blockchain. So you can get funding, financing. We give 700 million for pilots to test blockchain and how it can give us solutions. Um, it's, a, it's a useful um, application to avoid duplication of certificates or identity. So we could use that in Europe, actually. Yeah. So when we say blockchain, it has to be able to solve something. There has to be a problem. It's not yeah. about everything. Yeah. So, Mike, you invest across the ecosystem. Where do you see things? Yeah, so, listen, one of the, the problems is just even with the, the, the topic, cryptocurrency and blockchain, is a broad, broad topic. Yeah. So I'm going to try to split it up into, like, three buckets. That sounds good. So B Bitcoin, really, what's so unique about it, I mean, if you think about it, it's a miracle that, you know, ten and a half years ago, some man or woman you know, came up with this idea and coded it and sent it out into the world and now it's an $80 billion uh, store of value. You know, gold is 3,000 years. Gold's 8 trillion. Uh, and so we're about 100 times off. Um, and so, but Bitcoin really is sovereignty and it's the first kind of sovereign, non-government-owned non, non sovereign money ever. And that's a threat to lots of places. Uh, I think a was a bigger threat in people's mind when people thought, oh, it's going to be a currency. It's not really going to be a currency. It's a store of wealth just like gold is. Um, and if you think of it as digital gold, all of a sudden, the Treasury and the Fed, they're a lot less nervous. Um, it's important in places like when Greece is breaking down or if Venezuela uh, in, in, in places where there's instability and there's really no trust in, in your central bank or your, your, your treasury system. In most of the developed world, it's not, you know, the U.S. dollar is pretty darn stable. The euro is pretty stable. The yen and the, 
the RMB are pretty stable. And unless we have some spectacular financial crisis that I'm certainly hoping we don't and I'm not seeing, you know, you're not going to see this massive rush that everyone needs to have 50% of their net worth in Bitcoin. Okay. Um, but there are plenty of parts of the world where there's instability, where people are nervous about their governments. You know, if you asked, if you pulled the Chinese, uh, Mike Milken was saying this, he thinks there's a trillion dollars that would come out of China if it was allowed to. And so you're going to continue to see people use this new system of, of non-sovereign or of, 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 of of non-country but sovereign money. Um, and so I, I see Bitcoin adoption coming more and more. And as, you know, as young people get older, it's a lot easier to, for them to understand what a digital economy feels like. Yeah. You know, my, my mother has a harder time with it than my kids, just the concept of digital goods. And so we're at 80 billion, 8 trillion is a pretty decent sense of valuation to put a framework around it. So I think Bitcoin you can do. That's sort of bucket one. That's bucket it? one. Yeah. You know, bucket two is, is what Charlie was talking about. This, the, the rest of the, the, the ecosystem is very new. Most of it's not fast enough. And, and what I'm coming to understand is that you don't need the same level of decentralization and security for every last asset that trades on a blockchain. Uh, if we're trading digital points on a video game, you know, maybe you don't care how decentralized it is because the incentive for bad actors to corrupt your system is lower. The, 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 and so you're going to see these less decentralized, faster, more efficient uh, blockchains show up. We've invested in a bunch of them. Uh, and that's going to be the backbone for a while for, I think, part of the virtual world. If you look at the rise in esports and and gaming and uh, there was a concert last week, a 10-minute uh, concert uh, on Fortnite where 10 million people, 10 million kids logged in at the same time to watch a concert. And so that's a centralized system at this point. But pretty soon, the fake guy playing the fake guitar, uh, this virtual guitar player, that guitar is going to have value. It's going to have unique value and it's going to, you know, the, the, the whole concept of blockchain allows that to be a non... Uh, to be a scarce good, to be a unique good. And someone's going to buy that guitar and hang it on their fake wall. Just like, just like I would buy, you know, Mick Jagger's guitar and hang it on my wall in my, my living room because I saw that, him play that concert. I'm not uh, and, so sure about that, but it's interesting. Oh, I am sure about it because there's, there's a multi-billion dollar industry already buying and selling skins, they call you know, skins, which are the jackets and swords and, and helmets and guns that kids use in, in video games. But is Multi that blockchain? Why, why is that blockchain? I don't understand. Well, it, it, in order for it, to, for it to be unique, uh -huh. right, you, you, you need... Oh, yes, right, It's right. the same yeah. thing as... A, well, what, yeah. What's cool yeah. about it's Bitcoin like is I can't copy it. Yeah. It's the first right. uh, right. non-copyable digital good right. Right. and or non-counterfeitable digital good. Yeah. And so that opens up a whole new world. And as we kind of hurtle into this world where reality and, 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 and virtual reality kind of cross, a lot of that architecture is going to be blockchain-based. Okay, the truth is there is art, digital art now, that's yeah. happening, and you can uh, have the copyrights on blockchain, and then somebody feels they actually own something, and it's very special. Uh, but I would go to the, and, and yes, this is a market, that's true. I cannot understand it, but there, there is a market there. What I can understand is we can use it to uh, find out if there are fake produ uh, products uh, around, if a big companies like I know Louis Vuitton is working to find if the uh, online sales of their bags, um, they can be authentic or not based on blockchain uh, code to see if it's a uh, duplication or not, to see if the product is um, authentic or not, before mm -hmm. you even buy that. And I see also a solution for the deepfakes. You saw the video list uh, last uh, week, uh, a video of somebody saying something that they never did, a synthetic face. Yeah. Even Obama, the, the University of Washington, yeah, they yeah, did yeah. a synthetic video of Obama saying crazy things, and it was not him. But you cannot prove it. 
and I went to Facebook a few months ago and they told me, you know, we are uh, reaching this point where we cannot even tell if a video is real or not. Mm. So you could perhaps register videos on blockchain and make sure that there, is, there are time stamped and you can always go back and verify if it was real or not. Because imagine if uh, a day before my elections, there is a video of me saying something that I never did. Yeah. How can I prove it was not um, yeah. uh, the case? So I, I see the value there, but um, it's like shared economy, like Uber and Airbnb, we still don't have um, the best solutions there, and we don't have a harmonized environment or global standards, but I think we're going to get I think, there. I think that Mike Gibson is an example, because it's um, like deep, deeply related, at least to why I have conviction in the technology as a whole, which is that you could kind of view um, all of these different examples, securitization, or securitization of uh, traditional assets issued on these platforms, um, in-game items, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, like take any example um, as one part of like a massive iterated infinite game of what people are building on these platforms. Um, I think the Talib has this description of new ecosystems as stochastic forests, or the idea that um, if you have something truly new and unique, you're going to have a bunch of people competing in an infinite game to see what's most competitive, what ideas are most worth doing, yeah, yeah, what yeah. things end up winning. Yeah. So the, all of the different examples that you hear, I think, are like views, into the, views by people uh, who are in the weeds, into the weeds of like specific concrete examples of things that they find exciting and give an inclination for what kinds of things may end up being possible. But I don't think that you could really, um, I don't think that anyone could really like say that they have an honest intuition for exactly what will end up working. Um, rather, it's exciting because you have this you know, you've planted a thousand, uh, you've planted a thousand seeds, and we started to see the first like five or ten blossom. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so, I don't necessarily disagree with Charlie. I think that middle space, the innovative space, the venture space, is really early, and it's really exciting, and it's what actually gets people jazzed up. It's the fun part of the job. The third bucket, which is coming to you soon. Uh, is not as sexy and not as exciting, but it will be actually fairly transformative to almost everyone out here, which is to tokenization of assets. And what I mean by that is, like, this year there'll be $2 trillion raised in public equity markets and 2 and a half to $3 trillion in private placement markets. Yeah. Some portion of that private, private placement market is going to be tokenized. You know, we're in the St. Regis Hotel. The St. Regis in Aspen where I'm sure plenty of you have skied, that hotel tokenized 10% of it. So they, they did a security token offering and sold off 10% of that hotel. And now somebody in token form owns the rights to 10% of the, the St. Regis. A test case. We're looking at, quite frankly, doing a tokenization on a triple net lease portfolio. What could be more boring than consumer, you know, consumer leases, uh, real estate leases uh, in the Midwest? 7%, uh, 7.5% coupon. The buyers are probably going to be the same buyers that would have bought it anyways, but they're going to buy it in a tokenized form. Uh, it's going to give them a call on liquidity, maybe, uh, and it's going to give them easier transferability in the future. Mm -hmm. And so those are s small yeah. additions. And in essence, it's taking old products and putting a new wrapper on them. Yeah. And so that security token offering business, in the U.S. at least, is going to be only to... to uh, 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 qualified buyers. Uh, in Europe, you can, through Malta, if as long as the, long as the uh, KYC and AML, as long as you know your customer, you, you can actually distribute that through retail. Uh, I think in the long run, the democratization of finance comes, and in, certainly in the U.S., I think the mindset is, once there's some sobriety around the process, once there are trusted actors who are curating and selling off that product. My guess is the SEC will roll back and allow retail to, to participate in plenty of this private placement market that they never were allowed to. I mean, we let people go to a casino and gamble their heart's content or buy lottery tickets, yeah. but we don't let them invest in hedge funds. Yeah. Uh, and that, I think, philosophically will change. I think the regulators slowed it down because 
it, there was a mania going on, yeah. and now they're waiting to see the, the architecture and the sobriety built into it. But that's, one of, that's the future that's coming much sooner than you think. Okay, speaking of retail, I'll turn to the audience. If there are any burning questions, please stand up um, and wait for the mic, and I will remind you in advance that a question has a question mark at the end of it. It is not a lecture. She's tough. Fahed Sharikh from Tech Invest. Thank you all. This was very informative. I know you all personally, and I would like to ask a question to Eva, the regulator. And I understand, Mike, what you said about the, the, the value of, of, of Bitcoin being uncopyable or some sort of uh, uh, crypto that, cryptography that, that keeps it unique. But what is the intrinsic value of a Bitcoin? That's a question. Okay, great. Let's take. Let's just grab a handful of them, so and they can answer them in a. In a. Are there any other questions from the audience? Okay, that's our question. Then we'll we'll keep with the discussion. Okay, good question. It uh, is a good question. <laughs> yeah, but for me, so let me just say that uh, we don't all have the same approach in Europe. I would say I see value in Bitcoin. I like decentralization. Most of the legislators and the governments, they like uh, to control things. They like to control our data, to control our um, assets. Uh, I think that since we failed with the crisis, I see the potential there. More of the philosophy of, it, of Bitcoin, but I believe that uh, there are smart people working around solutions for scalability, interoperability, and this would give it increased value. It would take some time, but um, I cannot measure it with the price. I can see that it can be used for several things. Um, it can be used, uh, for example, as I said, for your health data, to be able to timestamp whoever enters and watches your data or sells your data or uses them for a bit, and you can revoke access to that. Um, so you can have a control of what you own. And I agree with the uh, uh, digitalized uh, to uh, the tokenization of assets and they can be transferable securities. If you have profit rights, it's one thing. If you don't have, it will be another thing. Um, I'm not sure that um, it's going to be fast because, you know, ECB has a different approach. Um, but uh, at the same time, we're trying to, to do what is good for the citizens. So if it's good for the citizens, but the banks don't like it, I think we're going to proceed and uh, use this technology more and more. Um, Gents, why don't I let you uh, chime in if you have well, anything. You know, to... So value is an interesting prop, right? So if, if you go to Fort Knox, there are these vaults. I think we have a different approach to what value is. <laughs> well, there's, there, you know, the inherent value, there, there's vaults, and you look at this shiny metal that sits there in musty cells and does nothing. You say, well, that's lots of value. If you take all the gold that's ever been mined in the history of the world, it fits in three Olympic-sized swimming pools. But so it has value. It has value solely because we say it has value. There's no, no intrinsic value in gold. You could literally put a 30-meter cube in the middle of Central Park and say, that's worth $8 trillion. Like, that makes absolutely no sense. If there is no marginal seller below $8 trillion, it's technically worth $8 trillion. I'm sorry? You know, if there's no marginal yes. seller below $8 trillion, like, yes. it's technically worth $8 trillion. It's like completely reflexive. It's valuable because it's valuable. Value is not that valuable. relevant. But even if what? you look at the it's U.S. It's not that relevant. Yeah. The well, value. It is that relevant because, so gold took 3,000 years to become this store of value. We've had 10 years of Bitcoin, but we're at a, you know, there's lots of properties that Bitcoin has that make it m a much better store of value than gold. It's more easily transportable. I, I, think, I think you can make a stronger case than that, actually. I mean, if you look at the U.S. dollar, the intrinsic value of the U.S. dollar is the wealth of the United States insofar as the government has an ability to tax its citizens. But the value of the dollar is far greater than the tax receipts collected by U.S. citizens. So there's no, I, I, I quarrel a bit with this notion that something should settle down to a quote unquote intri intrinsic value. Do you have a question? Yeah. So, um, you know, I have two questions actually. Okay. Uh, so Joan Agar with, with Golden Tree, thank you very much for, for, uh, for your panel. Um, first question is, uh, well, so I guess, I think last year or even some, uh, Noriel Rubini, who's, who's quite provocative, had a uh, you know very strong statement that you know uh, blockchain was basically you know just a database. Um, so kind of curious to get your opinion why it's not um, and why it's 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 worth more than that. Um, and then second one, which is I think a little bit more 
you know, I think it's exciting for at least for me. If you had to pick one exciting new project, not Bitcoin, and you know, sort of, sort of what gets you sort of really excited? What, what, what's out there? Definity, uh, you know, whatever project. What's your, what's your most interesting new project that's out there? Okay, so whoever wants to can take the database question, and then maybe we'll just go down the line for the most exciting. So, Charlie, your hands up first. Yeah, uh, blockchain is absolutely a database, uh, and the um, distinction between Bitcoin and like what is Bitcoin and what is blockchain is Bitcoin's coordinating on any given day somewhere between 50 and what was the peak uh, or like recent peak 100 called 100 billion dollars worth of value. Um, so, it's not the the enable like the blockchain's enablement of Bitcoin's properties that allow it to do this yeah, are novel and are what allowed Bitcoin to come into the world at this point. Um, you know, brought out global access to the internet, uh, like hash functions, cryptography, game theory, whatever, all that stuff. Um, but ultimately, like Bitcoin uh, is not a piece of software. Like it's a social coordination problem. Um, and I could copy all of Bitcoin's code um, and go run something in my basement that will not have people coordinating, you know, some X billion dollars worth of value uh, around it. It's it's like, um, yeah, it's it's much more of a social game theoretic problem than it is um, a technical one. It's just that the technical problems are hard enough that, like, when coupled, it makes very little sense, or it's at least very hard to explain. Okay, most, uh, we have sort of four minutes left, so why don't I just go down the line. Most exciting idea. So, I'm going to answer it a little bit differently. I think the two things to watch this year, which will be really interesting, right? So, Telegram, they did a giant ICO, uh, and they're going to launch their own version of what a blockchain or a messaging system, blockchain within a messaging system, or a crypto within their messaging system is. Mm -hmm. um, Telegram's got 240 million users. <sighs> And so we're going to see if someone can jumpstart a ecosystem, a, a new cryptocurrency, uh, with users who are already yeah. uh, who are already kind of uh, customers that are already yeah. addicted to their to, to their yeah. system. Yeah. Um, and so to me, that's going to be really fascinating to watch to see. I think how again, that though, works. that's an answer to bootstrapping the social coordination problem, and not the technology one. Again, to the extent that you can design a better database and have a natural base of users, um, or the reason that you'd be excited about Telegram is probably not uh, any technical aspect. Um, the reason you'd be excited about it is the fact that they have a 200x million user base is uh, like a very quick way, potentially, of bootstrapping over um, like the initial social coordination problem on it. Yeah. Yeah. I am on the nonprofit side, so I would say identity for me is an exciting uh, solution that could uh, blockchain help us a lot to achieve that, uh, to have an identity, uh, and nobody can duplicate that. So, um, as I said, I cannot measure the value because it's like you're asking me to measure the value of internet, and then there is applications. It's Google, it's um, it's Amazon. There are different applications based on that. So blockchain is an infrastructure. This is how I see it, a technological infrastructure. And the applications that you can build on top of that, they could be really exciting. So you could have everything you knew uh, until now, the most exciting projects. You can see them decentralized. But as I said, you have to have a problem to solve, to remove friction, to make it cheaper, faster, easier, to give more trust. Because this is what uh, people don't have now to the system. And this is what made, made it more exciting. But I wouldn't say it's for everything. Okay, like it wouldn't solve everything. Um, so uh, this is what uh, I think. Uh, it helped us a lot to, to believe that we could uh, have things differently uh, without borders. We can find solutions if we have new trust uh, built around us. And um, I think this is the value that it has. Okay. It can build trust. So identity is your number one. Uh, okay, so identity is the holy grail. Like, we, identity needs to get solved at one point. Yeah. There are a lot of projects working on it. To there's do transactions, lot, you need identity for everything. Of, you there's need There's a lot identity. of different approaches. And so this is, it's another space that I think over the next two to three years is going to be fascinating. Okay. Charlie, last word. Uh, I think we all owe him what our favorite project other than Bitcoin is. Uh, and kind of a cheap answer, but definitely Ethereum. Um, that's a totally so, I, I, will, I will summarize all of the very disparate views expressed today, or like my excitement for them, uh, with 
to Mike's point around uh, real estate asset issuance, uh, digital goods, and why stores of value have to exist in the world. Mm -hmm. um, to the extent that I, without touching essentially any existing or any traditional financial rail, want to swap the cash flows on some digital piece of real estate I own in EVE Online with you know, the St. Regis denominated in Bitcoin, uh, all of a sudden you have a credible, full alternative to the existing financial system. And that's essentially what's being built on top of Ethereum today. Okay, credible oh, full alternative to the nope. Credible full alternative to the existing <laughs> financial system is how we're going to end. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>